accounts to order. Welcome everyone in attendance. My name is Shannon Phillips. I'm the MLA for Lethbridge West and uh, chair of this committee. I'd ask that members and those joining the committee at the table introduce themselves for the record and then I will call on those joining us by video conference. We'll begin with the deputy chair. Yes, good morning everyone. Emily Searle Turton for Spruce Grove Stony Plain. Good morning, Grant Hunter from Tabor Warner. Good morning, uh, Rob Dreesen, Assistant Auditor General. Eric Leonti, Assistant Auditor General. Doug Wiley, Auditor General. Patty Hayes, Assistant Auditor General. Uh, Brad Ireland, Assistant Auditor General. Marlon Schmidt, Edmonton Gold Bar. Marie Renault, St. Albert. Good morning, Rocky Pancholi, MLA for Edmonton White Mud. Good morning, Nancy Robert, Clerk of Journals and Committees. Warren Huffman, Committee Clerk. And uh, we do have uh, four members joining us by video conference this morning. Uh, we'll start, with, we'll go uh, uh, with Member Singh, Member Tour, Member Lovely, Member Stefan, if you could introduce yourselves. Good morning, everyone. Peter Singh, Emily Good morning, Chair. Devinder Tour, Emily Calvi Falconage. Good morning, everyone. MLA Jackie Lovely from the Cameron's constituency. Good morning, Jason Stefan, MLA Red Deer South. All right, thank you very much. Please note uh, that we have a few housekeeping items. The microphones are operated by Hansard staff. Committee proceedings are live streamed on the internet and broadcast on Alberta Assembly TV. And uh, of course, the audio and uh, transcripts of meetings can be accessed via the Legislative Assembly website. Those participating by video conference encourage please turn on your camera when speaking and mute your microphone when not speaking. Uh, members participating virtually who wish to be placed on a speaker's list are asked to email or send a message to the committee clerk, Warren Huffman, and members in the room are asked to please signal to the chair. Please set your cell phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. We'll now move on to approval of the agenda. Are there any changes or additions to the draft agenda? Looking to the room, seeing none. Uh, if not, would someone like to make a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, moved by the deputy chair. Uh, that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts approve the draft agenda for today's meeting as distributed. Is there any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Oh, and uh, uh, we have uh, Member Yassine who has joined us uh, virtually. Member Yassine, if you'd like to introduce yourself for the record. Good, good morning, Emily Yassine from Calgary North. Very good. Thank you, member. Uh, we will now uh, move on to the approval of the minutes. We have minutes from the December 13th meeting of the committee. Do members have any errors or omissions to note? Seeing none, uh, I'll look to the floor that someone moved that the minutes of the December 13th meeting of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts be approved as distributed. That's moved by member Pancholi. Is there any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, that motion is carried. Now we'll move on to our guests from the Office of the Auditor General who are here to uh, address the report of the Auditor General uh, in November 2022 uh, and uh, other reports. Now normally we would have 15 minutes of opening remarks of the uh, between the Ministry and the Auditor General. <laughs> However, the uh, uh, AG has asked to have up to 20 minutes to make his opening remarks. We'll still follow the same structure subsequent to that, to 15 and 15, followed by 10, 10, 10. Tim, are there any objects to, obje objections to this request? Uh, seeing none, uh, we will now invite the Auditor General to provide his opening remarks, not exceeding 20 minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chair and Committee members. We might not take the 20, but uh, just wanted to give my Assistant Auditors General an opportunity to provide a bit of an overview of, of their work. So I won't be speaking too much. I'm not going to reintroduce the members at the table. I would like to introduce... Uh, a couple of members uh, sitting in the gallery though this morning we have Karen Zoltanko who is our business leader on the audit side so she looks after all of our audit methodology and make sure we're on this straight and narrow with respect to how we're doing our work we have uh, Pam Appleman who is uh, my chief of staff and then we have Cheryl Schneider who is the head of our stakeholder engagement so I welcome them here today as well thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss with you our November 2022 report. It's our most recent report. Uh, and as I said, I'll, I'll have a bit of a brief overview of the report, and then I'll share the rest of my time with the Assistant Auditors General. Um, the information in the report before you includes highlights of the uh, 
2122 uh, audit of the consolidated financial statements. It includes the results of our most recent COVID work and a summary of the 21 financial audit results of school jurisdictions in Alberta. The report speaks to the importance of public accountability and reporting to Albertans on program and financial results. It summarizes the results of our financial statement audits, and those results actually enable us to issue a clean audit opinion on the consolidated financial statements of the province this year, which is a very good thing. The report also identifies opportunities to improve processes to better uh, program and service delivery of the government. It also highlights opportunities for improved accountability to Albertans for results achieved with public resources. Our office provides government decision makers and members of the Legislative Assembly, each of you individually and collectively you today in this committee, <coughs> the findings and recommendations which we hope help improve the performance and promote accountability within government. Now we track and follow up all of our recommendations uh, and our report includes a summary of those outstanding recommendations. Currently there are 110 outstanding recommendations. I am pleased to report that 22 of our previous recommendations have been implemented and that we made 16 new recommendations since the release of our November 21 report and you'll notice those in each one of the individual sections they will be highlighted as new. And I believe the AAGs are going to briefly introduce those to you this morning. Our monitoring of those outstanding recommendations help ensure that they are acted upon. And we do sincerely appreciate the efforts of this committee in helping <coughs> advance the implementation of our recommendations. So with that, I'll pause and I'm going to ask Brad Ireland to start off. Brad? Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Doug. So I'll walk through the highlights of our audit of the Government of Alberta's consolidated financial <laughs> statements. Those highlights start on page 10 of our November 2022 report and include our audit opinion and the key audit matters. Um, so we issued a clean opinion on the province's consolidated financial statements, which means that we concluded the financial statements are free from material misstatement and presented fairly in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards. The key audit matters, which are those matters that would be the most significant items to our audit, and our conclusion on those matters are listed on page 14 of our report. And I'll touch briefly on those. Um, the first key audit matter was the government's investment in the Northwest Redwater Partnership. Um, during 2021, government restructured its arrangement with the Sturgeon Refinery. And we examined the restructuring transactions and ensured those were properly recorded and disclosed within the financial statements. Um, the second key audit matter was environmental liabilities. Um, these are subject to significant judgment and estimation, and we examined how those liabilities are recognized and disclosed within this province's financial statements. Um, the liabilities primarily from sites used by the Ministry of Transportation as well as the Ministry of Environment and Parks and the Alberta Energy Regulator. Um, the next key audit matter I want to touch on were the electricity rebates to Albertans. Um, the $50 per month rebates were announced close to year-end, and our focus was on ensuring those costs of those rebates were recorded in the proper period. And the last key audit matter was the COVID-19 response costs and programs. We examined the financial support programs and response costs and ensured those amounts were properly recorded and disclosed within the province's consolidated financial statements. Um, the next audit I want to talk about is our performance audit of the COVID-19 Capital Stimulus Initiative. The initiative was announced by government in June 2020 and was part of Alberta's economic recovery plan. The government committed to spend $1.6 billion on new capital and maintenance projects and estimated that investment would create 7,500 jobs. Our audit approach looked at systems to design the initiative, deliver it, monitor the results and report back to Albertans on the results. We found that the department had effective systems to design, deliver and monitor the initiative. Existing capital planning systems were used which allowed the department to get the initiative up and running quickly and efficiently. We identified one area of improvement, uh, the reporting back to Albertans on the results of the initiative 
and we found that the department's annual reporting did not include an analysis of whether the desired results of the initiative were achieved. The department's reporting focused on project spending and construction status. However, there was no reporting back on the number of jobs created by this initiative. Um, those are my remarks. I'll turn things over to Rob Dreesen. Thanks, Brad. Uh, my responsibilities are to provide oversight over our audit work in advanced education, education, culture, and the former ministries of labor and immigration and jobs, economy, and uh, innovation. We issued no new recommendations from our 2022 financial statement audits of these ministries in our November report. Uh, we did issue new recommendations uh, to some of these ministries earlier this year from our audit work, which we publicly reported in March and May. Most of the outstanding recommendations in these ministries have been made within the uh, past three years. However, both the advanced education and education have relatively old outstanding recommendations dating back between seven to almost 10 years. Advanced education, including the post-secondary institutions, have the largest number of outstanding recommendations at 16. Uh, as we've just recently completed financial statement audit work on the province's post-secondary institutions with June 30th fiscal year ends, uh, we will report the results of our 2022 audit work on all post-secondary institutions in our annual PSI report card um, in the first part of calendar 2023. Uh, I would like to draw the committee's attention to performance audit work we did on the small and medium enterprise relaunch grant program starting on page 87 of our November report. The objective of our audit was to assess if the Department of Jobs, Economy and Innovation had effective processes to design, deliver, monitor and report on that program. The program was designed with one significant difference from a normal funding program and that the department relied on applicants assertions that they were eligible for the program and did not verify those eligibility assertions until after a benefit payment was made. Um, that was reasonable given the need to quickly get money out to Albertans. Um, we found though that the department had not completed sufficient post payment verifications to conclude on program applicant eligibility and recommended to the department to complete that process. It's important to note that our recommendation is not about the number of verifications that were completed, but the sampling method applied by the department in doing their verifications. We found the method used did not allow the department to extrapolate the results of their testing over the remainder of the population to be able to conclude the program recipient eligibility overall. Department management needs to determine what further verification testing work is required to conclude on program uh, recipient eligibility and clearly explain to Albertans the results. We also followed up on the Department of Labor and Immigration's post, uh, similar post payment eligibility verification work on the emergency isolation support program, which we reported on in March and, and include that in our page uh, or on page 108 of, uh, of our November report. There we also found post payment eligibility verification processes were insufficient to allow that department to make any conclusion on the extent of program recipient eligibility. We did not make a recommendation to uh, Labour and Immigration to complete this process as uh, since applicants were not required to maintain support for their eligibility beyond April 2022, the department can no longer do further verification work. I'll now pass off to my colleague, Patty Hayes. Thanks, Rob. Good morning. So for the last year, I had responsibility for audit work in the ministries of children's services, community and social services, seniors and housing, indigenous relations, <coughs> municipal affairs, and justice and solicitor general. Uh, this past year, we did not issue any recommendations arising from, my, from our 2022 financial statement audits re relating to any of these ministries. But I will break briefly take you through some of the highlights of the performance audit work that my teams completed this year. On page 37 of our November report, we described the performance audit that we completed at Community and Social Services on their Family Support for Children with Disabilities program. We focused this audit on processes used by caseworkers to assess family and child needs and then to develop support plans. We selected these areas because judgment is required and this increases the risk of inconsistencies occurring in program delivery across the province. 
In fact, the department released a report last December where inconsistencies in program delivery were a common theme. Based on our audit findings, we made three new recommendations centering on updating guides for staff that support these processes, further developing training programs, and increasing effectiveness of oversight processes. Having good processes and tools to help reduce subjectivity and improve consistency will help eligible families receive similar experiences and outcomes based, based on their needs. On page 80 of our report, you will see we completed a new performance audit at the Ministry of Indigenous Relations on the effectiveness of reporting results for programs that support increased economic participation by Indigenous peoples in Alberta. The team issued one new recommendation to both this ministry and to Labour and Immigration. The recommendations centered on the department's setting targets, then analyzing and reporting on performance for these programs. On page 103 of our report, you will find the results of our assessment of five recommendations that we had made in 2013 relating to the controls supporting the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustees Management of Client Trust Accounts. We closed four of the recommendations, however, errors are still occurring in important areas, such as asset recording and financial planning, and so we repeated the recommendation that the office ensure its policies and procedures are being consistently complied with. And finally, on page 111 of the report, we described the performance audit we completed at Municipal Affairs on their two COVID programs, called MOST and MSP. Together under these programs, the department issued $1.1 billion in grants to municipalities across Alberta. One program was similar to existing municipal operating grant programs, but was targeted specifically to help with the extraordinary costs and lost revenues related to the pandemic. The other program was intended to stimulate the economy and create local jobs by funding shovel-ready capital projects. The tarp, the, the, Pardon me. The department was able to use existing systems and resources to administer these programs, and so we found that they had adequate processes in place to design, deliver, and monitor the programs. However, we did note the department could have improved how they reported on the results achieved with these monies in their annual report. In fact, all of the COVID program audits that our office completed this year revealed a lack of robust performance reporting as a common theme which is consistent with our June 2022 report, where we noted deficiencies in the nature of COVID-19 reporting in many of the 2020-21 ministry annual reports. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Eric Leonti. Good morning. For the uh, time remaining, I wanted to highlight new recommendations we made to Energy, uh, Environment and Parks, uh, now Environment and Protected Areas and Health, uh, since uh, the Auditor General's report released last fall. Uh, the details of these were included in um, releases from our office uh, earlier in the year. Uh, firstly, for energy, we completed a performance audit on the site rehabilitation program. And we did find that the department had done a good job when it came to designing, monitoring, and reporting on that program. Uh, however, one area where we found that improvement was needed and where we made a recommendation was to develop a risk management process that was commensurate with the level of funding involved, which was uh, up to $1 billion. Uh, the rapidly changing external environment uh, related to the uh, volatile energy prices and impacts from the pandemic, um, and the necessity for having key decisions uh, supported and, and documented. So for example, one risk that the department was aware of was that the demand for the program was declining as energy prices and sector activity increased, uh, potentially resulting in the program using less than the $1 billion that was made available by the federal government. Uh, we did not see evidence how the department evaluated this risk and what responses were considered uh, to support its, uh, its decision making. A lot of that was done uh, informally. In environment and protected areas, we completed a performance audit um, on the pesticide management program and we made three recommendations to the department. The three areas were to properly monitor risks, ensure public information on pesticides is current and accurate, and as well as having suitable metrics to, to evaluate the program. A few of the key findings that that audit included uh, were a lack of proactive inspections over the last five years, um, insufficient monitoring of pesticide application near water, and outdated and inaccurate public information on registered pesticide products. And finally, to the Department of Health, we made a recommendation to approve upon their grant management processes. This was in response to our findings when we examined the department processes around the grant to Arches. 
We found that the department did not have the necessary evidence to prove that it reviewed information received from the grant recipient and that the information submitted um, had been properly certified at, at the right level. Uh, overall, health and, um, and environment in protected areas uh, continue to have a relatively large number of outstanding uh, recommendations. Uh, while at Energy, we have seen the number of uh, outstanding recommendations be implemented over the last, uh, for the last few years. And uh, for all those recommendations where you've been notified that the departments are ready for follow-up, uh, we're in various stages of completing that work. Uh, thus, we're hopeful that the number of recommendations, particularly those that are older than three years, uh, can be uh, reported as implemented in the near future. And with that, uh, thank you, Chair and Committee. Uh, thank you. And it, does that conclude the uh, uh, remarks from the Auditor General's office? Okay, very sure, good. So we will now move to the uh, official opposition for a 15-minute block, please. Uh, Member Pancholi. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of you for being here today and uh, for your uh, fulsome report and the opportunity to ask some questions about that today. Um, I want to focus my questions today on um, the analysis in the report on the Small Medium Enterprise Relaunch Grant of Jobs, Economy and Innovation. Uh, of course, I will be calling it SMERG for the whole time because that's how we all know it. Um, so with respect to SMERG, uh, so on page 92 of the report, um, it says, and I quote, improvements should be made to monitoring and reporting systems. As well, it also includes a statement, uh, quote, the department cannot currently conclude that the majority of the recipients were eligible for the program, end quote. So as mentioned, of course, these were sort of urgently made payments to try to keep uh, businesses and Albertans sort of solvent in a, in a tricky time. So we understand, of course, that the, that the money had to flow quite quickly as a result of that. But I was wondering if, the, uh, if you can provide some insight into, you know, what was the departmental, departmental explanation for not verifying eligibility, fully investigating that at a later date? Was there any explanation given as to why they, they didn't really do that in a fulsome way? Rob? Uh, well, they have done some work. And so on page 98, it shows the extent of some of the verification work that they had completed. So there, there's lots of ways that you can um, do some analysis of the population after uh, the payments have been made. There's lots of different sampling methods. What they've done is to stratify the population into a high risk group and to a low risk group. And what we identified is that uh, while they did some work on the high risk group, there was nothing done on the low risk in terms of any sort of sampling that was completed. So, so that's why we identified and made the recommendation that more work needs to be done on that. Um, they had indicated when we were doing our audit work that they were still analyzing what they were doing with the high risk group because as you can see on, on page 98, um, they did identify that of the group that they did sample, there were a number that were found to be ineligible. Um, that might not be representative of that entire high-risk group. So again, more work needs to be done to assess what that means in terms of that category. Um, but, um, you know, we did not see plans for, for any sort of testing within the low-risk group. And so that's where, uh, you know, like I said, we, we made the suggestion uh, or the recommendation that, uh, that more work needs to be done on that because that does represent 96% of the applications that had uh, been approved. Thank you, Mr. Dreesen. That's, that's what was going to be one of my comments, was that the low-risk group, or how they've categorized the low-risk group, is roughly about $610 million of the $650 million that was allocated for this program, and that was actually distributed. And so, um, you know, was there explanation as to why no, one, no verification was done in the low-risk group? And, and actually, also, for my own interest, how did they categorize what was low-risk and what was high-risk? Do you have any sense of that? Uh, I, I think that when it came to high-risk, it would deal with you know, some of the organizations that had applied for the, uh, the funding. So some of the, the um, sole proprietors, for instance, would maybe be a little bit of a higher risk group. Um, and also um, certain uh, businesses in which two of the main categories for criteria were that uh, the, the businesses need to, or the organizations needed to uh, be able to demonstrate that um, they had to curtail or close their operations as a result of the public health orders. And that their revenues had also decreased by 30%. And so there may be um, certain uh, businesses within that category where, you know, being able to demonstrate that might be at a higher risk. So that's how they, they tried to segregate out the two, the two categories. Um, with the low-risk group, I, you know, there may have been... Um, 
maybe a, a sense that because they were assessed as lower risk, little or no work needed to be done on, on those applications. But as we point out in the report, it doesn't really matter if you categorize something judgmentally as low risk or high risk, eventually everybody needs to be eligible. And there are criteria set out in the program about what that is. And so work needs to be done to kind of verify that case. And it could very well be that, you know, because they have stratified it, that might, that might impact how much testing they need to do in both categories, but, but testing does need to be done. Thank you, Mr. Dreesen. And, and on that note, I mean, as you said, we've all agreed that there was an urgency to getting the funds out as quickly as possible. But essentially, given not only the, um, the small sort of sampling of just the high risk uh, applications and the, the zero sampling really of, of, the, uh, of the low risk, I mean, it appears that this, this program was essentially a sort of a pay first, which we understand why we'd want to pay first, but there was no verification afterwards, like a pay first, verify never kind of program. Um, it's essentially what we're seeing for a $650 million expenditure. Have you seen something like that before in, in a program? Um, do you have any sort of past experiences where you'd say, yes, this makes sense and we've seen this happen before? Is this acceptable, I suppose? Well, it's a unique situation. So have I seen that? No, but um, the pandemic created a, a, a situation where money needed to be uh, sent out quickly. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I think it is reasonable in terms of applying that sort of a process. We did see the same thing done in other jurisdictions. So it's not something that was solely unique to, to what was done here in Alberta. Um, so it, it, um, applying that sort of a process is, is reasonable in the circumstance. However, you then design the post payment after to do some work to verify the fact that what controls you did have in place and the assertions that you were relying on were in fact reasonable. And um, it, in a normal program, you would gather all that information first and then make a decision to, to pay somebody. Um, so you, you get kind of 100% coverage uh, before uh, the money goes out. Um, again, it's reasonable that they didn't do it in this case, um, and you would only be sampling a portion of the population. The important part is you, you need to make a sample that is representative of, of the entire population so that you can then extrapolate that result and identify just to what extent, you know, funding might have gone out to those that were ineligible and then making the decision about what you would do potentially on recovery of those funds or not. If, if, if I could supplement. So one of the things that we considered when, when looking at this was the consistency of the methodology and the application being applied both to other uh, similar, I'll call them emergency situations, as well as the ongoing requirement of other programs. So it's very well accepted practice to obtain support for grants, uh, you know, that's applicable in the income support program, the age program, the Alberta Seniors Benefit Program. Um, it's a requirement, for example, with the municipal affairs, the monies that went out there, as well as the safe restart uh, program in the education sector. And what we found, for example, just to provide some context, is that in those two other examples that I cite related to COVID monies going out, there was, um, you, you know, processes to, to look at uh, the, the money that was being spent and what was it being spent on. So, for example, in the education sector, uh, you know, they even went to lengths to require schedules to be provided back to the department from the school boards who received the safe restart monies. What we're seeing in these particular programs that Rob is identifying is, is an anomaly with respect to the, the support that was provided to demonstrate the eligibility requirement being met. And yes, you are correct. correct. These are significant dollars. Uh, having said that, we are in a unique time and we go to great pains to to explain that that yes uh, money was uh, uh, did get out the door quickly but at the same time uh, I believe Albertans do expect that uh, you know there would be there would be the same consistency of application of the requirements for eligibility being met among the COVID programs as well as the existing programs within the government so I'll just leave it there. Thank you Mr. Wiley I appreciate that. 
and, and I note in the report that it does say that management is considering next steps to assess these results. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite, do you believe that uh, the department is going forward and taking the recommendation to, com to perform that eligibility assessment, uh, and verifying those, those processes? And, you know, I'm wondering if you think there might be some reason to bring the ministry back to report on that to this committee. This is the, the, what the committee does, right, is look at those dollars and how they were spent. Do you think there would be value in having the department report on their progress since this recommendation has been made to the committee? I'll ask Ra Rob to answer the first part with respect to the dialogue with management, and then I'll come back and deal with the second part, Rob. Yeah, the, the department accepted all of our findings, um, so so they agree with with what we found. Uh, again, it's 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 a determination of the next steps and what that would be, and so with with the high risk category, uh, again because of how they've completed their sampling, they can't extrapolate this result across the rest of the high sample. So they're going to have to think about what to do next there. And then what type of sampling they would do on the low risk category. So there is some, some thought that needs to go into that. Um, what those conclusions are going to be um, and, and how they are going to do that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that's, that's going to be important that when they make those decisions, they report that back to Alberta so they can understand what they've done. With respect to the second part of the question, um, in part that's why we have um, this report and take this opportunity to meet with you is for this report to be uh, considered when determining the ministries that come forward to this committee and there's a there's a subcommittee I believe still in existence uh, and and certainly um, yes I think that our objective in bringing a number of these items forward is to look at learnings that were obtained through this period um, and I think that that would be very germane to exploring um, through this committee. I think it was, uh, as Rob said, a unique, uh, a, a unique situation. And to the extent that this committee can help with uh, those learnings and, and benefiting from those, I think that would be, uh, that'd be a worthwhile exercise, yes. Thank you to both of you. Um, I'm just going to follow up a little bit to it. I mean, it's, it's a, some relation as, as well. The comments in the report on the emergency isolation support program, similar challenges about, um, you know, verification after the fact. And I acknowledge that the report indicates it's, it's somewhat too late now uh, to go back because, uh, you know, people weren't expected to keep their, their supporting documents for this long. Um, but again, I'm sort of looking for what was the department's explanation for the lack of verification uh, for the emergency uh, isolation support program? What, you know, was there an explanation as to why it wasn't done after the fact? Um, so, so work was done in terms of the, the small sample that they did send out. Um, as we noted in, the, uh, in our report, um, the information that did come back, there was only 41 respondents, I believe, um, that responded back. And only a portion of those, they could actually verify eligibility, so a very small portion. Um, in the case of that program, they did put a cap on how long people needed to retain the information of only two years. So you've got a very small period in which you need to complete that work and be able to conclude on that. Um, because that work was not done until um, a little bit into that two-year period, you know, I think it's, it's more kind of a running out of time um, kind of situation where the amount of work that they could have done, they might not have been able to complete. And so... You know, I, th I think it's probably best to go to, to the department and ask them why they made the decision not to do any more work. But I think that that was a factor in, in, that, in that by the time that they had completed some of that and realized that more work needed to be completed, it would be an issue of whether they, they would have the ability to, to do that within the time period and get that information from, from individuals uh, that received money. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I think then it speaks to, as you mentioned, going back to the ministry and finding out why they didn't prioritize uh, in, in that brief two-year period of time seeking to verify. Um, and they, they, that wouldn't be part of the audit process for yourself in terms of providing that explanation. That's, that's not something that, okay. Thank you. I pre I'm getting a, for those who can't see the visual, I'm getting a, a shaking of the head. So, <laughs> so we can record that. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time in this block, but I do want to sort of touch on um, page 91 of the report, and hopefully I'll get some more time after uh, the next rotation. Page 91 of the, of the report states um, that respect to the audit of the SMERG program, quote, these findings serve as learnings for government in the design of future benefit programs. So I think, you know, there's opportunities here to see how um, funds are delivered in these kinds of programs, support programs like this in the future. So, um, you know, 
maybe I'll just put a, a put a, a bit of a pin on this because I don't think we're going to get much into the answer. But um, you know, we know that uh, speaking of future programs, the premier has recently announced that there's going to be support payments provided to individuals who meet certain eligibility requirements um, to help with affordability challenges. Right. So we know that there's going to be hundred dollars for every. Um, family with a household income of under 180,000 and seniors under 180,000 uh, per month for six months. Um, so this is this is going to be rolling out in January. I understand that in mid-December when the technical briefing was provided on this program, um, it hadn't yet been decided how that program would be designed in terms of would it be that the you know the the payments the systems the portals and verification data would be built by the government of alberta by the goa or would they outsource it to a third party so really the process of income verification hadn't really been decided on and it's going to be rolling out next month um i'm just conscious of my time i'm looking at it right now i'm going to maybe i'll just pause on that and we'll come back to it in the next rotation because i want to make sure i get a fulsome discussion on that so i'll leave that Okay, thank you, uh, Member Pancholi. We'll now move to the government side for 15 minutes for their opening block. We have Member uh, Hunter, and just uh, for the record, just before you start, Member, sorry, uh, we did we were joined by uh, uh, Member Panda. Uh, if he could introduce himself for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Prasad Panda, Calgary, Edmont. Very good. And uh, uh, Member Hunter, the floor is yours. 15 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to the Auditor General's Office for being here. I have a few questions um, that uh, pertain to this report, but um, I, I'm just wondering if I can just get, I don't know whether you can answer these now, but how many FTE staff does the Office of the Auditor General have at this point? I believe the uh, count is 145 right now. How does that compare to other years? Uh, we're a little less than last year. I believe we're, we're one down. Okay. What's the staff to manager ratio? I don't have that information for you today, member. Can you provide that for us? Member, the, the, the issues of, of, I wasn't prepared to talk to that. If you would refer to the select standing committee on ledge offices, that is where I, we give a wholesome discussion on our on our operations, our results, our budget, our FTEs, and, and, and all of those. I believe there were some questions on that, and they might be in the record, but uh, uh, certainly we could go back and look at, uh, look at the Hansard for what was discussed there, for sure. Okay. Um, sorry, did, so you would provide that or you have provided, I'm not sure what you said. I'm not there. too sure if we've already provided that to the Standing Committee on Ledge Offices, who, as I say, actually explores the operations of, of, uh, of our office, uh, not necessarily the audit work. So the division, as you're aware, is that committee looks after the operations, assessing our needs, our budgets, our staffing, our results, and this committee looks after our audit results. Um, so how many staff are working from home versus at the office? At, it, at it varies. Uh, we have a, a practice of, of uh, the, the, so the principle is, uh, it's a, it's, what's, what's the word we're calling it? Guiding yeah, we have these, we have these referred to as guiding principles. Essentially, all employees, the primary place of work is the office. However, recognizing that, and the second area, of course, where we try and do most of our work is out in the audit field. Uh, however, not all of our auditees are actually working back in the office. So in those cases, the audit teams would have to work remotely, depending on the individual projects. Um, and then the rest of the time, they would be working in the, in the office. So it really depends on, on the particular project, I guess, is the, is, is the, is the best answer I can give. Um, primarily, we are trying to work in the audit field as much as possible, wherever the auditees are, are back in the, in the office. Right. Um, so it, now, the practice of, of working from home, is this because of COVID, or is that? Sure. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Under 
Chapter 23B, um, speaking to a matter other than the question under discussion, the purpose of this committee today is to review the report uh, on the audits completed by the Office of the Auditor General. It's, as the Auditor General's mentioned, the details of the office itself and its staff and how it operates is dealt with under the Select Special Standing Committee on Legislative Offices. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just think that the um, Honourable Member uh, is just simply asking about the capacity of the uh, Auditor General to be able to perform the work that uh, we're discussing today. I think it's extremely relevant in terms of just seeing that uh, we have the appropriate human resources in, ta in place to be able to provide the information to the committee. So I think that this is just simply a, a matter of debate. Um, it, it, there's no question that many of these questions uh, are more properly in order at the uh, Standing Committee on Ledge Offices, uh, Legislative Offices. However, um, I think uh, if the Honourable Member wants to sort of, you know, ask these questions and then move on to some of the substantive audits, I think that's fine. Uh, and uh, yeah, he should feel free to do so. So please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my last question in this, this vein was really that, that question. With so many additional spending programs rolled out these past few years, do you feel you have enough staff to audit these programs and spending envelopes? Yes, that question was asked at the Standing Committee on Ledge Offices with respect to our budget submission, and my answer was yes. We put forward, the budget that we put forward uh, was a realistic budget. It was designed around the audit work that we currently do, and that we plan on doing. So yes, we believe we have the resources to complete the, the body of work ahead of us in the next fiscal year. Right, and that's, the reason why I was asking those questions is because I, I know that we're supposed to focus on the, the report here. I just wanted to make sure that it's fulsome enough as the work you do is uh, extremely important to help the government be better at what they do. Um, so that was why I was asking that question, those questions. Um, on page two of the annual report, it explains that the government had to respond with very time sensitive and often one time programs to support Albertans throughout the pandemic. The report also mentions that the Auditor General focused on COVID 19 response costs and programs. I'm pleased to see that your office found that the government department had processes to design, deliver, and monitor COVID programs and funding. What strategies were put in place by your office to? be able to examine those one-time programs in greater detail. So thank you, uh, Chair, for the question. So when this COVID first came in and we knew we would be doing some work on it, we actually uh, developed a, a bit of a framework, and that is what's outlined on page two of the report. And that framework in included a, a multi-stage approach to addressing the uh, COVID expenditures and the implications of COVID on government and, and uh, government programs. And essentially what we determined to do is we would break it down into a framework consisting of three. First, the financial transactions and those transactions that uh, specifically related to COVID, uh, we made a, a point of looking at those through our financial statement audits and auditing those transactions essentially through the consolidated financial statement line of work. Uh, <clears throat> next, we wanted to look at the accountability perspective. So we called that the corporate accountability view, and that's essentially was our June 2022 report, where we looked at the reporting within ministry annual reports on what was achieved uh, with the COVID funding. What were the results for the dollars expended? And then the third part of that was looking at it at a program level. And that's what you see in the results of this particular report where we looked at specific programs and were those programs well designed, were they implemented well, was there sufficient monitoring and was there sufficient reporting. So that was the, that was the approach that we, we took as an office. It was a methodical approach, we thought, fairly comprehensive and a three-part approach which, as I say, the third part is essentially looking at the programs that you see uh, in this report. Thank you. Page three of the annual report speaks about future COVID-19 audit work that will be released in the coming months. Can you update us and tell us more about uh, what this work will look like? Sure. So there's uh, two 
<coughs> significant pieces. Um, and actually, you know what, I'll just ask Eric and Rob to speak to, the, to both of those who are in the finalization uh, stage of those audits. Yeah, so uh, within uh, the Department of Health and Alberta Health Services, um, we have a, a quite a, quite a large performance audit that we've we've completed the examination work and right at the final stages of wrapping up the reporting on the response at continuing care facilities, um, and and that um, scope includes everything from the planning, the the monitoring, uh, the communication, and and reporting involved uh, related to to that response. And so that's something in the near future that that we plan to to, to release in in the health sector. All right. Thank you. Uh, we've. Uh, completed some work on the uh, critical worker benefit program um, and so we are uh, just in the in the final stages of, of, um, of finalizing everything related to uh, to our work on that and we're also uh, uh, doing some work right now looking at uh, the Alberta jobs now program so in the same vein as the member member Pencholi's, uh questioning um, there's more affordability uh, programs that are coming out from the government um, do you feel that that the work that you're doing now is going to be able to help the government be better at rolling those out? I, I certainly do. Um, I mean, s we've had some good dialogue with the ministries where we've undertaken the work now, and um, hopefully that will be factored into the the, the evaluation of of what worked well. And maybe areas for improvement, and that those would be considered um, going forward with 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 future programming for sure. Okay. On the summary of uh, recommendations um, on page five, I noticed that a few ministries had uh, no new implemented implemented or outstanding recommendations. In fact, the Ministry of Culture, Seniors and Housing, Executive Council, and the offices of the Legislative Assemblies have uh, all have no recommendations from your office. Is it normal for some ministries to have no recommendations? Uh, short answer, yes. Um, you know, the recommendations result from the work uh, being conducted and given the you know assessments of where we're going to be directing our resources some ministries uh, may receive more audit effort than others so for example we would be looking at larger spend organized uh, uh, ministries such as health advanced education etc um, one of the things I would mention is that we are rolling out as part of our recent business plan that again we had a really good discussion on I, I think was this notion of recurring body of work so we are implementing a rotational cycle uh, where we will be looking at grant programs at all ministries we will be looking at contracts at all ministries and we will be looking at results reporting at all ministries and those will be a rotational cycle so every ministry can expect to see us uh, at least once within a, a three-year cycle we're working out the details of that but uh, so, you know, again, the reason why a significant number of uh, a part of the government business is done through grants, contracts, etc. So, short answer, yes, some ministries you can see uh, less audit work than, than others depending on the risk uh, residing at that ministry. So, you, you, you say that it's dependent upon the risk of that ministry. Um, does the size correlate with the um, amount of recommendations your office usually provides? Uh, so when we're looking at audits, we where we're going to be doing audit work, as I say, we, we, there's so many factors that come into play, but part of it is the, the, the nature of the operations so and the spend. Um, so certainly we would want to be directing resources and auditing uh, where there are significant spends uh, of, of taxpayer dollars, but then we also look at uh, certain other areas that that would pose risk not only to the delivery and successive delivery of the program but on on uh, health and safety and welfare welfare of Albertans the safeguarding of, of assets etc so that also really directs the nature and extent of, of work that we would be doing environmental Eric mentioned one audit but we looked at pesticide management that was an issue of determined to be of safety uh, related to Albertans and we heard 
uh, from a number of Albertans with respect to that. So our work is, is driven by a number of factors. We receive, I believe last year was 144 direct uh, requests from Albertans directly. And then of course there's, there's input from the MLAs as representative of, of all Albertans. So a number of factors, I guess, direct uh, the nature of our work, Chair. Thank you. Um, on page 10 of the annual report, it says, it is our responsibility to express an independent opinion that provides re reasonable assurance that the consolidation fi consolidated financial statements are free of material statements and are fairly represented in accordance with uh, public sector accounting standards. Are there any metrics that your office uses to find reasonable in this context? <clears throat> reasonable materiality, yes. Okay. So the financial statement audits are, are driven around the concept of materiality and that's a numeric uh, number that is that is determined, and that in large part uh, determines the extent of, of uh, audit work and audit coverage that is required to be able to issue an, print, an opinion um, to provide that coverage. It kind of goes back to the line of questioning around the EIS and the, and the SMERG programs when we were looking at, at that is, Rob mentioned the, you know, the methodology used to do coverage of high risk, low risk. Well, in that particular case, uh, the issue is what's the methodology and the coverage to enable them to extrapolate the results over the population. So uh, short answer, materiality is a, a significant aspect, as well as disclosure in the, in the notes that help uh, readers understand the nature uh, of the operations and uh, disclose the transact and, and, dis and a disclosure of the nature of the transactions in the financial statements. Okay, and how often would you say mistakes and misstatements occur on financial statements? Um, well, there's a number of, I guess, mistakes. Uh, you could categorize them as mistakes, uh, categorize them as uh, opportunities for improvement in disclosure. Um, it's, it, it varies, I guess, in, in, in severity and nature. Where we get concerned is when the the um, the magnitude of those mistakes uh, get to that level of significance that would warrant an adjustment by management, um, or where there would be a requirement to change the disclosure in the financial statements to to ensure that what is being represented and presented to the user of the financial statements. Uh, clearly reflects the underlying transactions and substance of the transactions. So it's, it's, it's when either of those two are, are reaching, um, you know, on the materiality side, the dollar amounts are becoming significant, and on the disclosure side, that there's clarity of disclosure so that the reader will, will understand the magnitude of the transactions. All right, very good. We will now move to the official opposition for 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just going to follow up on, on the questions I began in my last block, and thank you to uh, MLA Hunter for bringing forward, uh, sort of carrying on some of those conversations around the learnings from the SMERG and the uh, employment, or, or sorry, the emergency isolation payments, what that can take forward into the affordability payments that will be rolled out next month. So, I mean, Again, these are different contexts in the sense that we're not going to be looking at an emergency situation like we were with SMERG and with the emergency isolation. Um, and of course, we've seen some challenges here with verification after the fact with those two programs. So what advice would your office have um, in terms of how to ensure that only eligible recipients uh, get the money under these affordability programs that will be rolled out next month based on what you did in these, these audits? Well, I think going back to the primary issue uh, here was you know, ensuring eligibility of, of grant recipients, which I think is commonly accepted as, as the right thing to do, with the, uh, with the juxtaposing as we've got to get the money out the door quickly, which was the issue here. You know, I don't know, one of the things that could be considered is, um, you know, maybe still requesting supporting information but not necessarily having to review all of that information prior to payment. But at least then the organization would have the information so that at a later date they could go back and 
review it and analyze it and, and verify eligibility. One of the issues that Rob identified here was that there was a time limit. So I think to the question that was posed earlier, um, you know, wh why didn't they follow through? Well, maybe, and I'm not speaking for them because it hasn't been described to me, but one could maybe assume that time got away on them a little bit. They had a time restriction. They didn't get the, inf they didn't have the information in hand and uh, and away you go. Whereas if you have the information, but that don't, doesn't mean you necessarily have to slow down the process. So obtain it. If you want a pre-issue, go right ahead, but then you, you have the information. That's just one thing that I just off the top maybe say. I really haven't done a, a thorough uh, analysis of all of the, you know, potential changes. I don't know, Rob, was, was that any of the discussion? That, did you explore that more? No, uh, as we've indicated in the report, I think the, the department really needs to think about those lessons learned and, and what they can do. Um, as the Auditor General has pointed out, um, you know, one of the things about the, the post-payment process is requesting all that information from individuals later, which is time-consuming. And maybe not everybody responds. And so trying to, trying to gather that up and then uh, the results of that, figuring out what to do when you don't get responses. By asking for that information up front when people are applying and getting all of that, um, you can hold that and then decide whether you would then examine some of that. You would have that information available. So that, that potentially could speed up the process. Sorry, if I could, Patty just wanted to supplement. If I yeah, could. I just have something to add. So when, when we did the, the COVID audits at Municipal Affairs, so this was giving grants out to municipalities using systems and resources <coughs> that were already in place. So it was a much smoother process for them. So I would say going forward, wherever possible, if the department's ministries could use existing processes and system, existing data banks that are already in place, um, that would be something that, that would probably help a lot in terms of verification. Thank you. That's um, very useful because I think when we're thinking about these affordability payments coming out and the lessons learned from, from the audit reports here, we know that, um, for example, the $180,000 household income threshold that has been used and put forward by the government was based on the child care subsidy model, which also has a top income threshold of $180,000. So when you talk about existing systems, certainly using an existing system, and in that case, the child care subsidy model, to verify household income, they rely on CRA income data. Right, because again, when, you, when I, I'm speaking to Mr. Wiley's comments about eligibility and speed, well, when we're talking about eligibility being, being based primarily on income, household income, for the delivery of these methods, it would make sense then to use, for example, CRA already quickly verifies household income as well as there's, that's used already in existing systems under the child care subsidy model. Would that be, I mean, a quick way to sort of determine eligibility when it's based on income, would that make sense to you as, as the Auditor General's office? And I mean, even within the ministries, they have their own data banks on folks who are in age and income support. And so number of children, that, that information is already there. It would be a matter of updating it to current status. But there are banks within the ministries themselves already that could be used and systems that are, that are well supported and have been in place for a time that could also be used. So it's not a matter of creating new systems, new processes. Um, that's where I would say the, the, the efficiencies are, are there to be gained. Would you, I would say, would you, would you say that it's not just efficiencies, it's also about accuracy, right? To determine actual eligibility or verification for, for yes, programs. Yes. So um, do you have any sense then of, of, you know, when we heard from the, the department on this program, potentially that's going to be rolled out next month, they weren't certain they were going to be using Canadian, uh, the Canada Revenue Agency household income model. Do you have any sense why they would choose to go or try to use a different eligibility or income verification process other than CRA for this kind of a distribution of a program? I have no information at all. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm going to cede my time over to my colleague now, uh, uh, MLA Schmidt. Thank you very much. So uh, I, I want to focus uh, on the analysis of the COVID Capital Stimulus Initiative detailed on pages 138 to 150 of the report that was involved $2 billion in spending. The stated objective of the plan, as you note on page 143, was, and I quote, to create jobs, end quote. This was a message that the government repeated uh, over and over again, but you also note that on page one, or you also note on page 144 that Treasury Board and Finance did not measure the actual number of jobs created despite adding projects during the program, and you note that TBF 
did not uh, validate the job creation estimates that the modeling tool produced with actual job creation data, nor did they update and rerun the model as circumstance changes. That's a quote from your, your own report. Did the department have an explanation as to why they failed to measure the only outcome that it put forward as a measure of success for this $2 billion in spending? I'll ask Brad to uh, speak to that. Um, I would just say no, we didn't get an explanation as to why they didn't measure that. Is that, is that a, a usual response? Uh, like when you, when you go and audit programs, there's significant spending programs like this, they only put forward one measure of success for the program and then they don't actually track that measure. Is that frequently done in government or is this, a, a, is this an unusual circumstance? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say our general expectation is where there are significant spend on programs or initiatives that the objectives of that would be clearly defined um, and that there would be reporting back to it on it. So that's our, you know, working at a high level, that would be our general expectation around significant spends. Um, you know, I think what you'll see from our July report of 2022 there when we did look at um, reporting back on objectives and whether or not those are achieved, what we, what we typically find is lots of reporting on dollars spent, but if there are you know, other objectives related to programs, sometimes the reporting on that, um, you know, we generally find could be improved. You note on page 147 of the report that since 2020, departments have not consistently submitted quarterly capital plan reports due to staffing shortages. And that has resulted in a lack of information for Treasury Board and Finance to evaluate initiatives throughout the year. So since 2020, uh, that's roughly $20 billion in spending without adequate oversight. Uh, and, and you notice that the government didn't really provide an explanation for this failure to do its basic due diligence. Can you explain to the committee what the risk to taxpayers is of the government failing to do its due diligence in this case? Um, so what I would say is in, in terms of the capital projects, um, you know, the government has an, a capital planning process that it uses annually to produce its, its budget. And, and what we found in, in this case was a lot of the, the, the processes and systems used to, you know, obtain information on capital needs and review that information and make decisions on capital projects was, was similar to, you know, the regular process. So in terms of approving projects, um, you know, we didn't see a, you know, a large risk there. Um, annual reporting on projects and, and dollars spent, you know, we saw that, you know, that was happening. You know, there was reporting on, on capital construction projects. So, again, not a... I, I thank you, Mr. Ireland. So we'll now go to the government side for 10 minutes, please. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you very much, Mr. Riley, for coming before us with the rest of your team here today. Um, I guess just a couple quick questions uh, regarding school jurisdictions. So it, it says that the total number of recommendations for schools has plateaued over the past three years. However, it is well below the 188 outstanding recommendations from 10 years ago as listed in the annual report. I was just wondering if you can expand upon uh, what has made it possible for this number to decline. Uh, well, I can't comment specifically what's... Uh given rise to the decline, but uh, it would be, you know, improved processes. Uh, we highlight in that section of a report, and I believe you're referring to the education section, our 19-4, we, you know, we, we categorize and, and break down the recommendations into, into several groups there. One is findings and recommendations relating to financial reporting and oversight processes within school boards or school jurisdictions, pardon me, the internal controls area, so how well those internal control mechanisms are working, and then the information technology and management recommendations. So 
I guess what I would surmise, uh, Chair, would be that, uh, you know, there have been Im improved um, mechanisms to prepare the financial statements, to report the financial transactions uh, with fewer errors, um, that the internal controls have improved within those organizations, resulting in less recommendations, and that information technology issues, uh, again, uh, would be better managed within the, uh, within the school jurisdictions. A recommendation is a result of, uh, of, of a finding, and you have a finding when a criteria is not, is not met. So there is that linear relationship. So I would suggest that each one of these process areas has improved. Uh, I believe it was a 10-year period where we said it was about 190, and it's down to 95 or something like that. So yeah, there's been a, a, significant, a significant reduction in the number of recommendations over that 10-year period. Excellent, and always nice to see that uh, level of improvement over the last couple of years to kind of address many of your concerns. I know I have a, a number of other questions, but I know a number of my colleagues are very anxious to ask their questions as well. So I'd like to see the rest of my time up to MLA tour to ask some questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Chair, and, uh, and thank. I would just want to start by saying thank you to the Auditor General and his department. I really appreciate the work you do for keeping the government accountable, especially when it comes to spending the Alberta taxpayers' dollars. So I will start my question to pages 59 to 61. They outline the recommendation from your office to the Minister of Energy. There is one new recommendation, four implemented and four ready for assessment, and two not implemented yet. Some of the recommendation include general goals such as documenting risk uh, management, developing performance measures, and ensuring board oversight. So my question is, can the Auditor General explain what factors will be assessed to determine if, just a minute, uh, that, that the changes, these were implemented changes are satisfactory, especially for those Four recommendations ready for the assessment. Thank you, Chair, uh, for the question. Um, well, our process is that for every recommendation, there are supporting criteria uh, that give rise to that recommendation, and that's where you have criteria that have, have not been met. So in, in each one of these, we would go through and assess the individual audit criteria that resulted in in that recommendation um, and that's what we would be that's what we'd be re-examining i don't have those specific criteria but maybe i'll ask eric if you could provide just a bit of a flavor of of, of what's behind the those individual four sure um so those uh, four recommendations stemmed from a performance audit we did in 2018 uh, related to risk management processes um, uh, to, to oversee the uh, processing agreement related to sturgeon uh, refinery. And, and actually, this is work where uh, we've, uh, we've completed um, the examination of the follow-up, and it's, it's something we, we plan to be reporting on in, in, in the near future. Uh, and in this particular case, you know, we'll, uh, as, as Doug was describing the process, um, you know, we had received an implementation plan that outlined the actions that APMC was going to take to implement, and, and that really, um, you know, guides our work to, to see if those are in fact done. Um, I had also mentioned with, with Energy um, that, that that was a ministry where we've seen a number of recommendations implemented over the last couple of years. Uh, four were implemented this cycle, and those related to recommendations we made as a result of our i examination. And then actually in the prior year, they, um, there was five uh, recommendations implemented by the Alberta Energy Regulator uh, related to pipeline safety and reliability. So we are seeing a, a good trend there as far as uh, recommendations being implemented. Um, and then the final one as far as what's not ready for assessment yet and, and, and is certainly um, uh, one that w we hope to follow up soon is uh, around environmental liabilities. And that, that's one that both the... the um, Department of uh, Environment and Protected Areas and Energy are, are working together on to, uh, to, to resolve. Uh, and actually, maybe more specifically, it's um, not the Department of Energy, but the Alberta Energy Regulators working with uh, Environment and Protected Areas. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, on page 38 of the report, you provide three new recommendations to Alberta Community and Social Services, more specifically to the Department of Family Support for Children, 
with uh, disabilities. All three recommendations relate to staff improving their ability to assess needs and to complete support planning. So my first question is, given that all three recommendations relate to the same issue, can you provide more information on how you were able to identify this problem? Well, I'll just speak at a very high level and then Patty can 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 supplement. So at a, at a very high level, we had uh, the scope of the audit was to look at a, a program, which, which we did. Uh, and then within that scope, we identified three particular areas of, of focus that we would be looking on uh, to see that, that certain aspects of that program are operating effectively. Um, and, and that's really what you're, you're, you're seeing here is that, um, you know, the first part was, was dealing with the consistency of, of, uh, of application of the program. And there what was determined was that, you know, part of the criteria would be that there should have been sufficient guidance provided to the staff. And, and it was determined that, you know, there was some, some opportunities for improvements relating to that guidance provided by staff. And also relating to the consistency of the rates that were being applied within the province. There were certain zones that had, you know, identified some common rates that would provide some consistency. Uh, but again, other zones within the province where there was uh, no, no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Best, best practice rate, if you will, within in that zone. So, uh, when we're doing a performance audit, we're looking generally at a program and then identifying specific aspects of that program, and that's what you're seeing here is the three elements of what we looked at. So the guidance provided, um, the training. Uh, it was an important aspect to ensure consistency of of, of of practice, as well then on the uh, the oversight. So the review of of the work that is being done, um, and 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 there was opportunity for improvement in in each three of those areas. Patty, do you want to supplement? Did I miss anything? Um, sure. All I would add is that we did focus on on specifically the assessment process and the creation of the plans. Uh, we knew from the department's own work that there were inconsistencies in program delivery. So depending on who your caseworker was and where you were going in the province, there were differences in what eligible families were receiving in terms of su uh, support and services. So the department explained to us that the tools that they used to create consistency included um, these guides, training, and, and oversight, and that's how we specifically narrowed down our scope to look at those processes and how effective they were working for the department, and we're able to then give some recommendations to them to improve that consistency. Well, thank you, and I think most of my question you answered it, but still, uh, another question, did your audit find any evidence of serious issues uh, arising from this problem, or are these... Uh, a simple recommendation based on the best practices? Well, I would say that there were concerns that families who were equally eligible were not receiving similar supports and services for their children. So in, in so far as that's a serious issue, I would say there, there was some serious issues within the program. And so we, we focus all of our work on, on risk areas and where we can add the most value. So in our determination, that was an area worth looking at uh, where we could add, add some real value to Albertans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Member Tour. We're going to go to the official opposition for 10 minutes. Uh, Member Trancholi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, want to follow up a little bit on my questions that I was asking earlier. I was thinking about your responses about how to best distribute income-tested uh, program supports to, to Albertans. And of course, we don't have existing programs that are used to delivering these kind of pro this kind of support to 2 million uh, Albertans, which is what we're looking at with the affordability program. So. Um, you know, it seems pretty clear that even the government of Alberta with its current income testing programs rely on CRA to kind of make that income assessment. Um, and it's and that's usually the best and, and you know, uh, efficient way to monitor and report standards um, for these dollars being distributed. So in your opinion, what kind of resources would be needed in your staff, system development, all these pieces to replicate the sophistication of CRA's income assessment processes um, at the GOA level. I mean, that's really what we'd be looking at if the government chooses not to go with CRA to, to distribute income tested supports. So based on your you know, experience, what kind of sophistication resources, systems, staff would be required to deliver that same kind of programming through the GOA? I 
couldn't answer that question today. Um, I just don't know the level of resources. Um, that's my short answer. You, thank you. Do you know of any um, programs within the GOA that are based on income that uses something other than CRA to assess uh, eligibility? Um, I'll look to the table. Well, I would say the income support and age programs and the, the senior support programs, they do you know, request that information specifically directly from the applicants. Um, so they don't, as far as I understand, also go to CRA for confirmation of those amounts. Uh, and thank you. And for those programs, though, you certainly wouldn't see the number of Albertans that we're looking to distribute in this case, right? So for two million Albertans, I mean, those programs you just listed are much smaller programs serving. So, you know, GOA wouldn't be holding data on two million Albertans with respect to their income. Would that be correct to say? As far as I'm aware, that's correct. Okay. Um, thank you. So I will then uh, cede my time back over to MLA Schmidt. So just going back to the questions around the, the capital projects. So on page uh, 147, the Auditor General report notes that uh, you, you did some testing on these projects. The testing confirmed that Treasury Board and Finance did not obtain detailed information on the status of the project, such as anticipated completion date, construction phase, or detailed variances by quarter, as is usually done. It seems to me that basic good governance is uh, falling to the wayside here. Uh, how can the government of Alberta assess value for money or even the timing of cash flows if it isn't properly tracking the billions of dollars in capital spending from 2020 to present? Isn't, isn't that a huge risk to taxpayers? So I, I would say from a financial point of view, in terms of tracking the, um, the spend, you know, we saw you know, good processes on, on that. In terms of tracking the project status, um, you know, I think that's what we're, that's what we're talking about here. And, and where this maybe comes into play with the, the stimulus programs is, you know, you're, you're interested in the timing of that spend and the status of those projects and when they're starting because you're trying to, you know, stimulate the economy during a, a particular period. So if you're not gathering that information, um, you know, quarterly, it, it, it sort of prevents you and, and prevents, it would be preventing staff at the, at the Department of Treasury Board and Finance to ask questions about the status of those projects. So, so just to be clear, the, those projects would be delivered at, you know, at infrastructure, at transportation, at, at school boards, different, different projects, and they would have detailed project management information. But if that information is not, not shared with Treasury Board and Finance quarterly, it would, you know, it would prevent staff there from asking questions about, you know, the timing and the completion dates and the flow of funds around those projects. But from like an accounting for a particular dollar spent in, in quarters, like I wouldn't have any concerns with the, the tracking of those dollars, but it would be tracking of those, the status of those projects. So I want to go back to the signature goal of the COVID capital stimulus initiative, which was to create jobs. We know the Treasury Board and Finance didn't track that, so there is no ability to measure the outcome. Uh, despite government consistently telling Albertans that they knew how many jobs they were creating. On page 147 of the report, uh, the, uh, uh, you conclude by noting, and I quote, additionally, the department does not plan to evaluate the initiative after it ended, end quote. So no real-time tracking on the objective and no after-the-fact evaluation. Uh, why would the government not do that? Is that not a best practice to even do a, a post hoc evaluation on the success of the program? Again, so the reasons why, I guess, I think you, you would have to ask the department, but our, you know, I guess our, our general expectation around the COVID programs, because a lot of them were one-time programs, is that at the end of that, you would do an evaluation, so sort of a post-program evaluation, and, you know, what did we learn from this? Um, so where the, where the capital stimulus, you know, program, I think their, you know, their thinking is, you know, that just sort of folds and rolls into the overall government capital plan. So it's it's not a... It's not 
any different than the capital plan spending that we have annually. That seemed to be the, um, you know, the reason we were provided with why a separate evaluation wouldn't be done of this compared to some of the other, um, you know, like the emergency isolation support program or the SMERG program where it's sort of a one, call it a one-off type program. I want to ask about strategic projects that, are, that were included in the COVID capital stimulus initiative. Eleven strategic projects were put forward, but critically, as you note on page 145, four of those 11 projects were approved by cabinet ministers with zero evaluation process from Treasury Board and Finance. On page 149, you identify those projects. First, can you confirm that I've got the numbers right? There was $301 million worth of projects approved by Treasury Board Committee of Cabinet with no evaluation by the official experts in Treasury Board and Finance? Yeah, I'm just trying to do quick math here. So yeah, I think that would be correct, 301, $301 million for those four projects. Let me just say that I'm very relieved that the Assistant Auditor General can do quick math at the table. In your auditing, can you think of any recent example where multiple capital projects worth a combined $300 million were approved by Treasury Board or a Committee of Cabinet uh, with no evaluation by the Department? Um, so what I would say about these is that, yeah, there was an evaluation criteria used by the department to review all of these projects. So there was, um, you know, a request out to departments that came up, came um, came through. Five hundred projects came back, and you know, an evaluation process was done to, you know, rank and assess those and, and prioritize spending. Um, so yeah, for these four particular projects, um, you know, they were brought forward directly to Treasury Board Committee and approved without going through the um, evaluation process by the department staff. Now that's not to say that these projects aren't, you know, needed or they're not, um, you know, necessary, but they weren't, um, when we were looking at the process and, and, and how they were allocating those dollars, they didn't go through that evaluation process that the department had developed. Do you have any insight as to why that system of government broke down? I mean, I know that politicians come forward with pet projects all the time, but the role of staff and, and the civil service is to provide some kind of objective evaluation, but that didn't seem to happen in this case. Do you know why? So in this case, what I would say is, um, you know, these projects may have been developed, or not developed, e evaluated by department staff, you know, so there are projects here from transportation, and, and you know, I'll have no doubt that the transportation had done work on that. What we're saying in our report is that those projects weren't evaluated by the Department of Treasury Board and Finance's staff that are, um, you know, responsible for capital planning. Do you know the transportation did evaluation or are you just surmising these projects would have we didn't look at those evaluations um, but these projects would have been on thank you we'll go over to the government side please uh, it's member Lovely. Thank go you. ahead please thank you uh, so much madam chair <clears throat> pardon me on page five of the report there's a table showing that Alberta Health has 16 outstanding recommendations that are over three years old. Many of these recommendations date back as far as 2014, before the NDP was in office. Can the Auditor General please explain if there are any procedures in place to monitor the progress? Um, yes, we, there's a, uh, we, our process is, first off, we follow up on all of the recommendations that we make. And the process is is that uh, to ensure that when we're doing our follow-up work, we're, we're aligned with the activity at the department and we're going in at the right time, what we request is that there's, um, you know, an action plan that's developed for how the department would 
deal with the specific recommendations. And based on that action plan, that would determine the, the timing of when we would be going in and, and doing recommendations, uh, follow-up work, pardon me. There are circumstances, though, that we'll, we'll go back, maybe given the nature of a recommendation, um, and sometimes the departments will ask us to come in um, and do a, you know, an interim look, so to speak. The point I'm trying to drive to is, though, that we, we, we follow up on, on all of our recommendations, and when we do that work, it's, it's best to do it when the department indicates that they're ready, uh, that they have implemented the recommendation, and then they demonstrate how they have implemented that recommendation, and then we will come in and make an assessment if, uh, if their assertions are correct. Eric, did I miss Thank anything? You. Oh, sorry, go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, I was just gonna move on to my next question. Um, Given the significant delays on these recommendations, has your office identified specific obstacles to make progress on these items? So as far as the, the suite of health recommendations, there, there's one uh, grouping there where we've, um, we're in the middle of doing the follow-up work around chronic disease management. And so, you know, some of those, those recommendations, you know, did take a, a fair bit of time for the Department of Alberta Health Services to, to implement, and, and in some cases certainly understandably so, because they're quite, quite substantive and, and, and broad uh, recommendations uh, to, to implement. So we're in ongoing, you know, conversations of the progress of that work uh, and whether the actions are being, being completed. So um, obviously the, the results of the, all the various follow-up work is, is to come, but I, you know, hopeful to see that the greater than three years number will, will decline over the coming years as we're able to uh, report on chronic disease management, as well as um, there's three outstanding recommendations related to seniors care that we'll be reporting uh, alongside our, our uh, COVID-19 response and continuing care. So there's a couple of you know, pretty major areas where um, you know, it's taken a little bit of time, but the, uh, the follow-up work is, uh, is largely completed. Thank you so much for the if answer. I, on page 71 of the report, you recommend that the Department of Health improve its uh, grant monitoring process. Can the Auditor General explain what contributed to this new recommendation being made and what metrics you will be using to measure whether the Department of Health has made progress on this goal? So that related to... Um, uh, some of the comments I made in my uh, the opening remarks, uh, we were looking at a, a grant that was provided to uh, Arches, and uh, as part of that work, when we were looking at the process, uh, we did identify a couple areas that that could be improved that you know applied more broadly to to the grant management processes within uh, the Department of Health. Uh, primarily, um, you know, there being evidence that financial information that's received by recipients, evidence that that review has actually taken place. Um, the other element to that was um, there's a requirement that there's a, a senior financial officer uh, from the recipient that signs off on information that's submitted to the Department of Health. Um, and one of the things we identified through this was that it wasn't always necessarily clear if the department knew if uh, the person signing off, you know, had the necessary, um, you know, qualifications or, or that that position uh, and part of where the risk arises there is that you know you have some smaller organizations where you know the the department may need to um, you know recognize you know who, who might be in a position to be able to, to do that but they, they lack some of that information to, to, to know that so um, we felt that um, you know it was appropriate to make a recommendation there to uh, to help improve the grant management processes uh, overall well, thank, well, thank you so, so much. much with that I'll see my time, time to MLA Singh. Sing. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, would like to thank the Auditor General and the officials with him for being here today. And I appreciate all the work's been done by your office in ensuring government ministries are working within the bounds required for efficient and effective public service. And my question relates to the parks, environment in parks here. And on page uh, 64 of the report, you provide three new, new recommendations to Alberta Environment and Parks. All three of the recommendations relate to pesticide management, with the first being that the department regularly ex assess risk from non-compliance with pesticide laws and employ compliance monitoring process to mitigate the identified risk. 
And what are some of the obvious indicators of non-compliance with pesticides laws? So that uh, recommendation, recognizing um, environment and, and protected areas has a lot of different areas that they're responsible for. And so, um, you know, resource scarcity is, is not uncommon. And so that, that certainly requires a, a greater focus on risk to decide what work you're going to do and where. Um, in the case of pesticides, uh, what we had found was a lot of the um, non-compliance or um, complaints resulted in a lot of reactive type of work and, and really there was a dearth of any proactive type of inspections and, and so obviously you can't inspect everything and everyone that that's certainly not cost efficient but um, having some risk framework to decide what you're going to look at proactively was was the driver behind that that recommendation. Um, there's a number of different potential areas for non-compliance. Uh, one that we do report on uh, that is often very top of mind is use of pesticides near water bodies. And there's uh, specific requirements of um, you know, when that um, work is done uh, based on what the weather is and, and those types of things. And we found that there were deficiencies there. Uh, and some uh, areas of non-compliance. So, so there is a, really a wide range of things that could result in non-compliance, but there are particular focal areas um, that, that uh, I think warrant a risk-based uh, look. Thanks for the answer. And how much will these indicators need to be expanded in order to better access the risk of non-compliances? Um, uh, sorry, could I uh, ask for a repeat of the question? I missed the yeah, first part there. How much will these indicate, indicators need to be expanded in order to better access the risk of non-compliance? Uh, yes, understood. Um, well, that is actually part of uh, what the department will have to establish as they're implementing the recommendations. So the, the various uh, you know, inherent um, risks that are in place uh, related to uh, you know, their regulatory work on, on pesticides. Um, and then, you know, deriving the appropriate response to that. So that, that is actually part, uh, I presume, would be part of what they're doing uh, as far as um, their actions towards the recommendation. And again, thanks for the answer. Can the Auditor General confirm that there was particularly higher rate of non-compliance uh, with these pesticide laws? Um, so as part of the testing we, we did, I mean, we could see where, you know, non-compliance, whether through, you know, complaints or, or whether there was information supplied to the department indicated there was non-compliance that, you know, there was a, you know, sort of a follow-up uh, process uh, for that. Um, I did already mention, I mean, specific work we did to look at use around uh, water bodies and some of the, the, some of the reporting that uh, those that are using pesticides have to provide. Um, you know, we did we did find some some uh, non-compliance there. Um, also, uh, another key um, item that arose uh, was just the the listing that needs to be, you know, regularly updated and ensure that only registered products are on there and that only registered products are actually being used. And and we found some some issues where it looked like, uh, you know, products that were no longer on the the list were actually being used. And the department had to go back and just to make sure if that, you know, was in fact, you know, a, a, an illegal product used or was it just an error in their data. So there's a little bit of cleanup that had to take place at the department as well, just to make sure that they had all that correct information. But ultimately, our, our, our approach was to look at the, the process and how that was functioning. And uh, we did also want to recognize that, I mean, it's not like they can throw an unlimited number of people at regulatory activities for pesticides, so that they're designing a good good process to capture those risks and appropriately respond to them. Thank you, uh, thank you for answering my question here. Once again, I express my appreciation to the Office of Auditor General for all the efforts in ensuring the accounts of government ministries are in order. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Member Singh. Uh, fourth rotation then over to the official opposition, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to, to dig into uh, the, the capital projects again. So just, just to be clear, the Auditor General didn't, office didn't actually look to transportation's evaluations of the projects that were put forward as part of this COVID capital stimulus initiative. Is, is that correct? You just looked at Treasury Board and Finance's analysis of the, the reports, or of the projects, sorry? Yeah, for, the, for those four projects, what I can say is we did not we did not go to the Department of Health, Transportation, or Education and look at um, 
you know, the amount of work they had done on those projects. So if I could just, if I could just supplement yeah. again. Back to when we were doing an audit, we scope an audit uh, and what's in scope. And, and in this case, we were auditing uh, the process at the Department of Treasury Board and Finance that it was using. And what you're seeing here is we're identifying where there was exceptions to that process, and we're identifying those and, and highlighting those. So we weren't auditing in this audit processes used by transportation or other ministries. It was the expectation was that uh, they'd be following the process, and uh, where they weren't, we'd bring forward the exceptions and report those. So I I, I guess my concern is that. Uh, for, for example, there was a $120 million road, the uh, expansion of Highway 11, that ran right through the, uh, the minister at the Times constituency, the former vice chair of priorities and implementations committee of cabinet. <coughs> now, uh, this was a $120 million project that was spent with no evaluation from Treasury Board and Finance. Um, you know, what... What additional information, I guess, would the people of Alberta need to know to make sure that this wasn't just pure pork barrel politics on behalf of the now min member of R Rimby Rocky Mountain House Sundry? Like, like I, I, I understand that you, you just evaluated Treasury Board and Finance's process. This was an exception to the process that you identified. The Auditor General hasn't yet gone back to Alberta Transportation. If what what question would somebody looking into this need to ask to make sure that this was uh, a, a project that merited construction and, and not something that was just a pet project by the minister? Well, again, we would we would we would cite the criteria that are being used with respect to the specific uh, program to determine whether they uh, you know met met that criteria, if you will. And I just want to take this opportunity to loop this back to the performance reporting. Again, um, th this is an opportunity where if this program, there was a reporting back on the effectiveness of this program and, and, and the efficacy of, of, of its operations, this would be an opportunity for management to describe exactly uh, what happened here and what process uh, those projects went through. Um, so again, I, I think trying to highlight the importance of performance reporting, it's not a perfunctory task, it's an opportunity to help inform so that quite frankly, uh, members such as yourself and Albertans aren't, aren't asking these questions, what's going on here? There's an opportunity to, to describe fully and we're not saying anything nefarious is going on. Again, our point here is that you had a process and, and in four particular cases, it was not followed. And it's not for us, quite frankly, to be answering that. That's an excellent opportunity where performance reporting is a great opportunity. Uh, we had included in our performance report where we uh, mentioned earlier where we met with, with the committee. There were certain performance measures that we did not meet. We did not achieve targets in one particular area. Uh, but it was an opportunity for us to describe why, right? And, and then if there's further questions, we're prepared to answer that. But I think that's... This wholesome notion of performance reporting, it's a great opportunity to help inform uh, and to deal with the type of questions that you're now asking, member. Uh, so just one final question for me. Uh, n noting that the process uh, had some exceptions here and that transportation could have done the analysis, is that going to be the work of some future uh, uh, investigations by the Auditor General? Will you look further into these projects and, and see if the pro pro proper processes were uh, in place by Alberta Transportation to approve these projects? Go ahead, Brian. I would say we don't currently have any projects to, to look at that, um, you know, but that is something we could take under consideration. Um, you know, and just to expand maybe on your earlier question, so transportation would have detailed criteria they would use about um you know when they would twin roads when they wouldn't when they repave roads when they shouldn't and all of that so so they would you know they would 
they would have answers to those questions as to you know where this this particular project or other projects fit in their prioritization model based on on the criteria they use. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over now to my colleague Mary Ugrino. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask some questions just around FSCD, which is uh, Family Supports for Children with Disabilities. So the report notes that training for FSCD is not being delivered effectively. Um, it is essential that all FSCD caseworkers are equally skilled and able to assess need, plan supports for the child and family, uh, training completion time, overall training completion, and even review of training materials was really, re really poor. Uh, regional differences are glaring and often service levels are influenced by the time of year, the location, and the worker. So at the time of the audit, um, how many, so I note that there were 260 um, active staff members that were identified in the report in Alberta at the time of the audit. Now, I've tried a number of times through budget estimates and other, um, other ways to try to get a number. So is there a difference? I'd like to know, like, do you have the, the number of staff from the year before so you're able to identify any differences? That were specific to the FSCD Yeah, FSCD program. caseworkers. I don't have those handy. Oh, if you could yeah. table those later, that would be great. Uh, if you might, if yeah, it might to. be something worth asking the department. Uh, okay. They would have that information. So my problem is I have asked the department a number of times and I'm not getting that information. And the reason I'm asking that is since uh, 2019, uh, Community and Social Services has lost over 500 FTEs. And so with the three recommendations focused very much on staffing, so frontline caseworkers, as well as managers, because oversight was clearly a problem uh, in this performance audit, obviously. And so it's just, I'm wanting to see, like, ha does it have something to do with the fact that over 500 FTEs have been lost? So I'm just not able to find that information. So if you have it, that would be great. Um, I was also going to ask about staff turnover rates, if, if the Auditor General's Office has that information or if that's available. Okay. We do not have that information available. Okay. Again, that would be something that the Ministry would track. Yeah. Okay. So, do you, um, so the Ministry is taking much longer to determine eligibility, to approve supports, to sign contracts and renewals, and there really are no published um, acceptable timelines for each stage. So there's application, and then there's a, an assessment portion, then there's the development of the plan. Now, was there, are there any timelines internal to the Ministry, like sort of benchmarks about how long these different phases should be taking? Yes, I believe they do have those types of targets internal to the process. Um, and I'm just checking, just need to refresh. I believe some of those might even be externally reported. I've not seen them, so okay. if, that'd be great if you could uh, point us to those. Well, Later again, on it, is fine too. Yeah. Again, if the ministry has those internally, that would be the best place to ask would be of the ministry for those targets. Just like to say on the record too that, you know, in all budget estimates and even through public accounts, well, the CSS meeting got bumped obviously, um, but that I have tried for a number of years to get that information and have not been able to. So one of the other questions I have is about the wait list. Because there are no clear goals and benchmarks, that uh, we have this wait list, so open data is showing, and the latest uh, is December of 2021, is showing that there are almost 4,000 families in different processes, whether they're in assessment or they're in planning, just means they don't have the supports they need. And uh, I've asked the ministry about their wait list, any plans to address the wait list, and I don't get anything back. And there are literally 4,000 families noted in there. And so I'm wondering if there was any work by the AG's office to, to look at that wait list, to look at the growth of the, the wait list. Any work at all there? Or? As a part of this audit, we had not focused on wait lists. It was specifically at the assessment uh, and needs planning. Okay. I, I have other questions, but I'm out of time. So. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Member Renault. Over to the government side. Uh, Mr. Yassine, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Auditor General, and your team for the work you do. Uh, I'll be quick here getting to my questions. I noticed on page 80 of the report that Indigenous relations only have one new recommendation, and it states that the Department of Indigenous Economic Participation should improve its performance reporting process for its 
programs to achieve increased indigenous economic participation? So my question, can the Auditor General please further explain how these improved performance reporting processes will help lead to greater indigenous economic participation? Uh, so I just want to be clear, Chair, the question, how these recommendations uh, to improve performance reporting will help? Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, well, this program, I believe, was originally established uh, by the government in 2000, thereabouts, and, and it's really was originally designed to deal with uh, achieving self-reliance and enhanced well-being of Indigenous peoples. And then in 2020, um, it was articulated as improved economic security and prosperity of Indigenous peoples in Alberta. And our point is that there are programs that are in place, uh, monies are being expended, uh, and yet there's an opportunity to determine what is being achieved. So what are the results achieved uh, for that spend? And that's why we're actually make the three-part recommendation, which is, um, you know, to establish targets for all programs. So uh, what are the objectives and then what is, what's to be achieved by the program and then reporting back on that. The learning would be what's working well, what's not working well. Uh, do we need to invest in programs that are working well? Do we need to stop investing in programs that are not working so well? So it's, it's really that, you know, performance reporting is, is part of a continual learning uh, uh, envelope too, where you know the idea of you, if you have an objective, you, you 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 know you go and do the work, you report back, and then you assess whether you've achieved what you wanted to, and you make a an assessment uh, again um, of how do we how how best to achieve that objective. So it really is about coming back and and achieving what the the objectives of of the government and and the programs are. That's why. Uh, performance reporting is is important from that learning perspective but then there's also the public accountability perspective and, and reporting back to the legislative assembly on what was achieved with the investment of uh, of tax dollars so hopefully that helps yes and thank you uh, I will pass on to my colleague Emily Stepan now Uh, members, Stefan, you are muted. There we go. I have a question about the December 22nd or December 2022 Auditor General report. Uh, page 98 of the report says that, um, as discussed earlier, that 5,400 applicants were identified as high risk. We sampled just over a thousand of them, and over half of them uh, were found to be eligible. So the one question I have is with that kind of result, when you have over half of the high risk applicants identified as ineligible, are a hundred percent of the high risk going to be verified? Member, I'm not too sure at this time what the department is is going to do. What we're reporting on page 98, as you cite, is the results of the department's own work, um, and it that is they've determined that 546 were ineligible, which represents 52 percent. I'm not sure what they're going to do in following up on that. Rob, do you know? Uh, no, that is one of the questions that we had asked. Um, and as I'd mentioned earlier, because of how they completed their sampling, that 52% can't be applied to the other 54 or to the remainder of that population of 5,400 uh, high risk applications. So they would need to do some other analysis or some other additional testing to get comfort to be able to make that conclusion uh, on, on the population as a whole. So the, the testing that they have completed, because it was more judgmental in terms of how they made their selections, um, that would provide information strictly on that uh, roughly 1,000 um, um, payments or, or applicants uh, that they examined, but they uh, it wouldn't provide any additional information on the remaining, uh, you know, roughly 4,400. 
Okay, um, maybe as a supplemental question to that, because I know we're running out of time, but as I understand it, uh, SMER cost Alberta taxpayers over $600 million. Um, I'm wondering what deterrents in the program design are there against fraud? Um, are there financial penalties for inappropriate uh, applications? Is there interest on monies that were inappropriately uh, paid? Uh, I, I don't know all of the details uh, off the top of my head. I'm, I'm not aware of anything. It would simply be that if you were determined to be ineligible, you would need to repay any monies that were paid to you back. But I'm, there was an interest component in addition and, and, and any sort of an additional penalty. I, I'm sorry, I can't recall that off the top of my head. All right. Did your um, department look at the value for money uh, comparing the economic benefits from this program uh, versus the six hundred million dollar cost. Uh, we did not do that. In fact, we asked the question in, in term when we looked at the design of the program. We looked to see what sort of measures the department was actually going to look at because um, the the overall objective was the program were, were to help these organizations through this time. So how are they measuring that, and how are they going to make that assessment? And as we point out on page 99, we didn't see any assessment being made by the department looking at that. Um, there's, uh, they had indicated that there may be some additional analysis that they may do and that it may come out of that. But at this point in time, we haven't seen anything um, where they've done that type of analysis. Okay, I'll uh, cede my time, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so my questions are uh, related to recommendations on page 157 to Treasury Board Finance. Of course, uh, all Albertans and taxpayers appreciate they have a balanced budget uh, now, but uh, I just uh, wanted uh, to talk about the um, you know, the liquidity to reduce government debt and minimize borrowing costs. Specifically, how much is uh, TBF currently spending on servicing the debt? And if they include uh, all your recommendations like uh, effective utilization of our liquid assets, what would be the net uh, uh, total net impact of the changes? Uh, uh, on the budget and on the economy. Uh, Chair, through you, I'm not too sure if we can answer some of the specifics on the, the actual changes in the economic impact, but I'll ask Brad to see at a high level if we could try and address, address your question. Yeah, I don't, I don't have specific numbers, but what I, what I can say is, so yeah, we've got five recommendations here related to cash management from um, 2016. And a lot of that was looking at ways in which the government managed cash. And if you were, you know, flowing funds out to different entities, you had cash in various pockets that you couldn't utilize and couldn't spend effectively. So I know right now the Treasury Board and, and Finance is, is implementing a new system around pooling cash better to help to, um, you know, minimize interest costs and, and, and maximize returns on that cash. So they're in the process now of implementing a new um, liquidity management strategy. And that is going to be something that we, um, you know, we look at in upcoming audits. Uh, you are, Honorable Member, you're muted. Sorry, Chair. We all agree that by paying back uh, debt uh, quickly, we avoid paying uh, hundreds of millions in interest to the banks overseas. So we can use that money for uh, public programs, including building uh, uh, infrastructure required for uh, delivering public programs. Do you agree? Uh, thank you, Honourable Member. We now have uh, three minutes per side to read questions into the record, if there are any for um, for written follow-up. I will look to the official opposition. Uh, no questions. Uh, I will look to the government side. 
No questions. No questions. Alrighty then. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, that now concludes uh, uh, the form of piece of our uh, meeting here this morning. Um, if there were any outstanding questions uh, uh, that were requested during the Q&A period, we ask that those be responded to in writing within 30 days. Uh, and is there any other business for discussion right now? Uh, there will be no caroling. Thank you, uh, Member Pancholi, uh, for that. That is out of order. And uh, so um, the uh, date of the next meeting will be at the call of the chair in the new year. Uh, I'll now call for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Member Hunter. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? The committee is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>